Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to this bumper three-part edition of Goal Hanging. Now, why is it three, I hear you ask? Well, because we're talking all about the Three Lions, England's 1,000th international game. And we'll split this into three parts. Episode number one, we're going to be talking all about the history of England, the foundations on which England football was built. That's the stadiums, the kits, everything like that. Episode number two, we're going to be talking England tournament. Now, historically, we've not done fantastically in tournaments, but we've picked our top five anyway. Episode three features England's top five moments. It could be anything from an appearance. It could be a milestone cap, a milestone goal. It could be absolutely anything. And that's what we are discussing in episode three. So stick around. We hope you enjoy the videos. Keep checking everything out. Enjoy. Hey, what's up everyone? This is Dan again from Rebellious Noise. I am here, goal hanging today, and goal hanging with me. I've got Scott and I've got Mike. Now, this episode is gonna be slightly different to what we're normally doing, because there is a little occasion coming up of England's 1,000th international game. And Happy birthday. Well, it's not a birthday. To celebrate that, we are going to be going through the history of the England men's football team. We're also going to be touching on our five top tournaments that England have been in and our five top moments in England history, as voted for by the Goal Hanging panel. So, guys, understand you've got your beers? Not English. <laughs> I've got my coffee. Not English. Which means we're good to go, boys. Let's talk football. I'm really, I'm really impressed with the set this week, Dan. I'm yeah. Really impressed. No, no expense spared, really. Oh, We've got all the uh, everything, as you can see, is all some England. nice retro kits there. Uh, great moments in history, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Exactly. Um, obviously, the drinks, as always, I'm sure. Yeah. Plays with them, you know. Some Big-headed fight. footballers. Big from head, your, yeah. I understand they are from your personal collection. They are from my personal collection. Yeah, a, bit, a, bit a little dirty. bit battered and, <laughs> and bruised, but you know, some I'm of them sure. fallen over, but that's not unlike many old England players, you know, yeah. at the time. And to be fair, there's a lot of them that are battered and bruised, which I'm sure you know they would have had in the game would have been throughout the years. So really, you know, so, they'd yeah. be quite proud that they're you know showing, well. yeah. showing that they're getting stuck in. So there's even a trophy to show that England did actually win a trophy yeah, at yeah, one point. So. So yeah, let's just um, let's just get in straight into the um, the history of England, really. So it's actually the joint oldest um, football team in the world, uh, formed at the same time as Scotland. Obviously, England had a bit more success, but you know, not much, but a bit more. Um, and yeah, so a representative match between the two was played on the fifth of March, eighteen seventy. Love it. Way before all of us were born. It was actually yeah, played at the Oval, which is a famous cricket ground. Uh, finished in a 1-1 draw, and that was organised by the Football Association. Uh, they did a return fixture as well, uh, organised by representatives of Scottish football teams on the 30th of November 1872. Played at Hamilton Crescent in Scotland, and that's viewed as the first official international football game because the two teams were independently selected and operated, rather than being the work of a single football association. And I'm sure you guys will appreciate this. England... They were going balls to the wall with their formation. Mm. It was a great formation oh, they played. Great, it was one yeah. full back, yeah. one half back, which we would now know as a centre back, and eight forwards. Wow. What a line, mate. Eight That's forwards. That's like the reverse of a Mourinho tactic. <laughs> exactly. You know, like park the bus, yeah. This like it's That's like ride the bus. That's like literally put your yeah. foot down on the bus. <laughs> Um, and in that game, Scotland played two full-backs, two centre-backs, essentially, and six forwards. I love that. I love how new it is that you, they're just trying the most random... Well, it seems random now, anyway, yeah. you know? Like, I love that. And surprisingly, any guesses on the score of that game? Nil-nil. Nil-nil. <laughs> nil-nil. And there's like, what? That many forwards and it's nil-nil. Yeah. <laughs> 14 forwards on the pitch. It ends nil-nil. So... Yeah, the early history of England, we actually had our first defeat on home soil to a foreign team, was a 2-0 loss against the Republic of Ireland in 1949 at Goodison Park. 
Um, yeah, we've had like our largest ever defeat as well by mm. a foreign team was when we played in Budapest against Hungary. They beat us seven one. Is that when's that? The early days of the World Cup sort of time. Yeah, they like, were I think it's nineteen nineteen fifty three. Yeah, they did, did, were was good. that when they had Pushka? Probably around that time, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah, they're really good. Um, yeah, and England's um, a player called Sid Owen, not Ricky from EastEnders, <laughs> said that it was like playing men from outer space, was a, an exact quote from him. Mm. Um, and also, 1950s, 54 in fact, was the first time England ever made the World Cup. Um, it had actually been running since 1930, uh, yeah. was the but first we, ever we World Cup. But we refused to take part in the first few. Yeah. Um, because we knew we weren't going to win it. Well, <laughs> the thing is, though, back then, England, you know, football was still a new sport in England, obviously, pioneers, in the official code, at least. Um, and what, so what, I find that really interesting because Great Britain won the Olympics, I think, in 1908 and 1912. Yeah. The Olympic football, which was a fit like the first kind of World Cup. Were we as England or Great Britain? Uh, it was as Great Britain. Oh, it was Great and Britain. it was also an unofficial first World Cup. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, maybe there'll be a graphic that pops up. But he basically picked teams from all around the world. And this like, really random team, uh, West Auckland FC, actually <laughs> uh, played for England. And I think they beat Juve in the final, in the second final. Mm. That's kind of looked at as the first World Cup. So England were kind of like, because from what I've read, they thought we don't need to prove ourselves. We don't need to join it. And there was all this other, yeah. I guess, political stuff going on. And then they... Because there was a few games where like Italy won the World Cup and they faced England and that was meant to be the real World Cup final because they right. faced yeah, yeah. England who were like the right. best, considered the best. By the time we joined it, 1950, the USA batted us, yeah. <laughs> which is not a nice thing to say. But um, yeah, I find that really interesting. And it, so I feel like we'd have more World Cups under our belt if we had just we'd have, like, signed up in 1950. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, 1954... It's saying was um, we reached the quarterfinals for the very first time. Lost 4-2, uh, a scoreline that you're going to hear a bit throughout this episode. But this time we lost 4-2 to the reaning champions, Uruguay, Good surprisingly. Well, yeah. Um, so, yeah, just a little um, brief bit on like the early England managers as well. So, Walter Winterbottom, who was actually England's first, time, first ever full-time manager in 1946... Um, even though he was the manager then, the team was still picked by a committee. Okay. Surprisingly. Okay. Um, until That was until Alf Ramsey took over in 1963. The man's jacket up there. <laughs> yep, yeah, there you go. And uh, the shirt that England wore in the 66 World Cup. So, yeah, so he took over in 1963. Um, obviously, a uh, famous tournament happened three years into his reign as England manager. Uh, 1966, there's a certain World Cup in England and um, I won't, won't touch on the result too much now but um, we won um, so yeah and uh, then in Euro 68 two years later we reached the semi-final for the first time and we're eliminated by Yugoslavia which to our younger viewers is now split up into a number of nations notably Serbia Montenegro mm. those kind of countries so, yeah, and then we qualified for the 1970 World Cup in Mexico as reigning champions. And we reached a the quarterfinal there, knocked out to West Germany. We'd been 2-0 up, but we eventually lost 3-2 after extra time. And then we failed in qualification for the 74 tournament, which led to Alf Ramsey's dismissal. I feel like there's nothing more embarrassing than missing out on the World Cup and the Euros. Like, mm. every time we've not made it, it's just, it hurts so much. Seems like, the Euro 2008... You know, yeah, like, that was a dark and uh, even like obviously with Holland in recent years when they didn't make the World Cup and the Euros, like it's such a shocker. Yeah, it just seems like when um, the year ends in a four and it's a World Cup, we don't seem to make it. So I recall nineteen ninety four, we didn't make either. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, USA ninety four. Yeah. You know, it's like Tottenham only win trophies when the year ends in a one. England only <laughs> don't qualify don't. when it. Uh, yeah. When it's got a four in, was it Euro two thousand and four, the one that we didn't qualify as well? Two thousand eight. Oh, yeah. Two thousand and eight, yeah. we didn't yeah. qualify for. Yeah. Multiples of four, maybe. Multiples of four. There we go. Which uh, historically will happen at the World Cup because there are every four years. <laughs> <laughs> so we've touched briefly on um, England managers and the early origins of England, but it'll be rude for us, you know, with a backdrop of such an array of kits, not to touch on. England's historical football kits. 
So our traditional home colours, as you know, will be white shirts, navy blue shorts, and white or black socks. And periodically we've worn all white kits. Mm. Although our first away kits were blue, our traditional away colours are actually red shirts, white shorts, and red socks. 1996, another famous England tournament, it was changed to grey. Uh, it was only worn three times, actually. Which is weird because the scene is quite legendary. Now. Yeah. Um, and the semi-final of Euro 96 against Germany um, was probably the most famous time it was worn. And the deviation from the traditional red was quite unpopular with the supporters, yeah. actually. Which is strange because like you touched in there with a the blue as well. I, I don't know if you've seen the old the original blue kits but they're really nice that kind yeah, of some of them that, really, that nice. really nice blue so now we had like a light blue third shirt oh that one as well with the big lions well. the yeah. umbrella one yeah that was quite nice um but um uh, i think there's rumors that the euro 2020 away shirt is going to be blue actually oh, so okay. yeah that would be interesting yeah because it was um so from 96 we had the gray one and then we went back to red mm. and it stuck with red all the way through up until 2011 when it was the Navy blue with like the light Good, blue yeah, yeah. sleeves. I think it was oh, the one yeah. that we that wore. Nice. Is it, we wore a Euro 2012, I believe. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I believe. One of yeah, them yeah, we wore, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hodgson's first tournament. Um, yeah, that was, that was all right, that one. Yeah, and they're also, uh, sometimes the uh, away kits are worn at home games to promote... Selling them. Yeah, <laughs> to promote selling them. It's all about the monies. So, occasionally we've also had a third kit, we touched briefly on that. 1970 World Cup, we had a third kit with pale blue shorts, uh, shirt, shorts and socks, sorry, mm. against Czechoslovakia. We also, in 1973, had a kit that was similar to Brazil's, which was yellow shirts, blue shorts and yellow socks. 1973, wow. we wore that in the summer. And for the World Cup in 86, very we had a summer, th yeah. Yeah. Theme, very yeah. summery yeah, colours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yellow is more associated with England goalkeeper shirts. Yeah. But it's a classic there as well. Yeah. Um, and then in 1986, we had a third pale blue kit imitating that worn in Mexico 16 years beforehand. And we retained the pale blue third kit until 1992, but they were rarely used. And talking of kits, um, Umbro first agreed to manufacture England's kits in 1954 supplied most of the kits with the exceptions being 1959 to 1964 when Bukta. Bukta, classic. Uh, and then in 1974 to 84 when Admiral, Admiral made yeah. some, some classic really kits nice kits well, yeah. actually. Yeah, we should definitely do an England kits episode, I reckon. Yeah, Maybe, definitely. Uh, yeah. I mean, keep keep an eye out. There'll, be, an eye some, out. there'll be some kit episodes. So, yeah. Um, and then Nike purchased Umbro in 2008 and then took over as the England kit supplier in 2013. There we go, and that's it, we're here now. So, a brief um, history on the stadiums, as we know, the first 50 years of their existence. England played all home matches around the country, initially using cricket grounds before, later moving on to football grounds. The original Empire Stadium, built in Wembley, for the British Empire Exhibition, now known as Wembley Stadium. Yeah. I like the name Empire Stadium. Yeah, it sounds a bit more yeah, grand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, rather than just Wembley, it's like that's just the name yeah. of the area that it's, it's in. Does, yeah. uh, England played the first match at Wembley in 1924 against Scotland, and for the next 27 years, Wembley was used as a venue for matches against Scotland only. Oh. So yeah, and then obviously we know what's happened in 2000. There was the demolition of Wembley. And then England again went on the road, playing all around the country, then returned to the spiritual home, was it around 2008, I believe? Was it mostly Old Trafford was mainly used as the... There was, I remember ball. there were games, Old, Old Trafford, Stadium of Light, St Mary's, um, yes it was, to be, I think it was mainly Old Trafford yeah. being probably it was like the biggest so, ground yeah, in the I'm country. I remember during that, the sort of 2000, the qualification for the OC World Cup, I remember it being a lot of the games at Old Trafford. And then there was yeah. one at Upton Park as well, England, Australia, when Rooney yeah. made his debut. Yeah, we lost that one. I didn't go to that one, but I remember we lost that one. I think Harry yeah. Kills sort of spark late that night. So Yeah, about the only time I think he did. Yeah, but Fran Francis Jeffers scored his uh, only England goal, Francis I think. Francis Jeffers, eh? Blast, Blast. Blast from the past. Yeah. <laughs> Franny <laughs> Jeffers, eh? Yeah. Arsenal legend. It wouldn't be a history segment without some uh, old names, eh? Exactly. <laughs> some of the uh, England one-cap wonders. So, you know, we've not got time to go into all of them now, so... <laughs> 
So there you have it. That was the history of England. That was the foundations on which this great country's football team was built on. And next, we are going to go straight into episode number two where we're going to be talking tournaments. Following that, we'll go into episode three where we talk about top five moments. Don't forget, if you want to get episode two and three as soon as they come out, click subscribe at the bottom, leave us some nice love, and you'll see it ping up soon.